morning, everyone. I'm Audrey Boisno. This is Mortgage Pros 411, and I'm here with Kevin Casey. And today we are joined by Selma Hep, who is a PhD with CoreLogic, their chief economist. So we're really excited to have you here, Selma. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, just quickly, just a little heads up on what we have to look forward to this week as far as economic news coming up. We always warn them, Selma, to you know, stay on top of it. Don't don't rest on your laurels and don't think you're going to get a big advantage by waiting to lock. So Thursday, <laughs> we're seeing home sales coming and GDP, and we are expecting revisions on the GDP. So that should be interesting. And then Friday, the market's closed, yet we will still get PCE, the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. Uh, they're expecting headline at 2.4 year over year, core at 2.8 year over year. We'll see what that looks like when it actually rolls out. And it will also be very interesting since the market is closed. I kind of like it. I kind of like it that, you know, everyone can kind of digest that information for a minute and then so, decide how they feel. Overreact. That's right. No, maybe. Yeah. Friday won't be a whipsaw of, oh my God. And uh, yeah, then they could figure it out all out on Monday, right? <laughs> It would happen between so, so now and then on Monday, and all the pundits have their opinions about uh, what happened on Friday. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so Selma, tell us a little bit about you. And I'm very interested in the fact that you were a realtor in Florida in 2004, and here you are today with a PhD, and you were the chief economist for CoreLogic, which is, in my opinion, one of the best data sources that we have. I mean, just rock solid information always. And so how did you do that? Where, how'd you go from one place to the other? Well, it was a windy road. <laughs> I am not one of those people that had um, planned out my career early, early on. I sort of went with where the best opportunities were. So I was doing my master's in, in economics uh, up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and that's where I met now my ex-husband, and he was very much a real estate um, enthusiast. En enthusiast? Enthus enthusiast? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so he wanted to start a, a real estate company in Florida and then so on and so forth. So anyways, I joined him and we moved down to Florida. And while he had the mortgage and um, he was also a real estate attorney, I was doing the sales well, what turned out to, which, you know, I, I should have known better, to, but to do that, I'm not, I'm not a good salesperson. I'm, I will be honest. I am much better behind my big screen computer and analyzing numbers and, and, and I'm a thinker, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a talker. Um, so, yeah. so, it, so it came more natural to me to think about things than to actually go out and try to do a sale. So, so I, I stepped out of that and I decided that I was going to pursue a research career um, and I went back moved back to Washington DC and went to University of Maryland and got my PhD in, uh, with focus on these urban economics real estate um, mm -hmm. you know issues and and so one thing led to another you know it 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 turns out you also have to be a storyteller as an economist and I kind of could do that um, somewhat okay <laughs> we'll see how i do here today but yeah so it was that's how i ended up here today you know it's it's not necessarily that i planned it this way but i will say having been a real estate agent helps a lot when i yes. think about the housing market and and understanding what's relevant um uh, mm -hmm. so it, it is a huge help for me today it is we find that it is a huge help for people in positions like yours to have had some experience in what we do because mm -hmm. otherwise they have no clue. They really yeah. don't know what they're talking about. It's all theoretical and it's all, you know, sounds great when you're sitting in a, in a conference room somewhere, but it doesn't necessarily translate to the street, to the consumer, to how the interactions really happen with the buyers, the sellers, the LOs, the realtors, the whole kit and caboodle. So, mm -hmm. wow, I've never said that before on the on here, Kevin. <laughs> anyway, it is, um, so I appreciate the fact that you have that background. It's a big deal um, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, you also worked for California Association of Realtors, correct? I did. I did. And the National Association for and Realtors. National oh, wow. Okay. We're going to have Dr. Lawrence Yoon on with us in a few weeks. So um, 
we enjoy having him with us. He's their chief economist, as I'm sure you're aware. That's so great. anyway, yeah, it's yeah. always it's always interesting to dive into somebody else's mind. Well, right? I used to work for Lawrence <laughs> when I was at NNR. You yeah. did? Oh, that's great. That is great. Yeah, he's, um, you find him to be a great guy for. Yeah, we love him. He is. He's very. He's interesting. He's very personable. He's very. Um, forthcoming with his information he's not you know he we really enjoy him so we're always grateful that he'll join us here so yeah. um all right let's start off with some good news that came out today Kay mm -hmm. Schiller and FHFA came out with their home price appreciation which showed that things were very strong for a January normally we see worse numbers in January than in other parts of the year right and this uh this year Kay Schiller was down a tenth month over month and um it but it's six percent appreciation year over year is what they're showing and then fha is at 6.3 percent year over year over year and remember the fhfa is just conforming loans guys so mm -hmm. that is not everyone so i mean those are good solid numbers right in in 2024 selma yeah yeah absolutely so actually i cover a, a case Schiller and core logic um have a relationship in terms of the case Schiller index so i i get to report on it on on tuesday morning at 5 a.m pacific time oh. last tuesday of every month oh. um so i did a report today on on case Schiller, and yes so the the index was up six percent year over year uh, keep in mind that home prices were declining in 2022, a latter part of 2022, when mortgage rates started increasing. And so we had seven months of consecutive month declines, and they bottomed out in January. So today, we are comparing our numbers to that January when the home prices were at the bottom. So ah. going forward, yeah, that's um, in, in many ways explains why the strong annual the, rate of growth. So January 2023, they bound, bottomed. They bottomed, exactly. Yeah, and then we sense. saw very rapid appreciation last spring because what we ended up having is mortgage rate decline and buyers rushing in, but not sellers coming back in. So right. we had that, again, imbalance in the market that led to uh, relatively stronger appreciation seasonally than we would see at that time of the year. Um, so 2023 spring was really strong. So as we now move to spring spring months or data starts moving to spring months, we'll see that rate of year over year changes slow down because we are comparing now to, to you know, prices that were appreciating last spring. So it's going to be slower going forward. Um, but still, you know, when I think about what we thought was going to happen coming in tw into 2023 with high mortgage rates and, you know, just affordability in general, we thought home prices were, well, a lot of people thought home prices would decline much more, mm -hmm. um, which which they didn't. And we now, as a result, saw a 6% six six appreciation. So, you know, I think that's, um, it speaks to the demand, you know, I'm big on, on emphasizing how strong the pent up demand is and how uh, even with increases in inventories that we've seen, it's just simply not enough. You know, it's simply not enough and, and home prices keep going up. Right. Well, that is a great point. Thank you so much for pointing that out about the la how we got to the higher or the lowest point last January. Uh, the projections for this year are a little lower as far as overall appreciation, which I think most of us are okay with. I would much rather see three, four or 5% than 20, 30% for God's sake. That is scary and not sustainable it's not sustainable exactly yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so anyway so i that's all good news right i mean you tell what, us what, what is the what is ideal in an ideal market what's appreciation level is a good healthy number is it well you want you want home prices to appreciate at the same rate as incomes basically mm -hmm. so that you are not pricing people out of the market right? right and so that would be anywhere from two to four percent i mean it depends period in recent history you're looking at but in that's where we were you know when we when you think about what happened prior to the pandemic uh it was about four percent rate of appreciation for a long period there uh coming out of the great financial crisis and that's really was sort of in line with you know mm -hmm. somewhat where the incomes were but you know there's there's details there around income growth as well, you know, but but we, we, incomes were stronger because inflation was low. And now we have a little bit of a loss in real income because inflation has Inflation's been high. Than, so, right. so, 
Yeah, but ideally what you are looking for for a healthy market is uh, home prices uh, growing in line with incomes. Gotcha. That makes total sense. So you indicated that everyone was, uh, many people were expecting that 2023 was going to see a crash in real estate. That was certainly a lot of the headlines that we saw and a lot of the expectation with a consumer because that's what they're hearing from the news, right? But that didn't happen and no, no one that we're talking to is expecting that to happen. So our 2024 forecasts are fairly solid, not huge, but again, we'd rather have that than anything else. So based on where you thought things were going to go in January of 2024 to we're almost at the end of Q1, how'd we do? How are we doing so far in, in 2024, you know, based on what the expectations were and now we have some reality to compare it to yeah i mean i think we're falling in line back to where we were pre-pandemic in many ways you know uh so so that's you know thinking about first quarter numbers you know december at the end of last year was a little bit weak in terms of home prices and we, we again saw some monthly declines because mortgage rates exceeded eight percent you know that was a that was a shock to the system you know really you know when you think about three percent going from three percent to eight percent so uh, affordability crunch was was real uh at the end of last year and we could see that in uh home prices appreciation you know a lot of markets we're seeing declines especially markets that you know are more dependent on affordable uh a buyer a buyer who is more you know dependent on affordable uh -huh. uh, inventory versus you know you have some markets that are more markets. luxury and yeah right. yeah yeah um they are a little bit less sensitive to mortgage rates than than um affordability driven markets so when you look at across country markets that really slowed were those you know where Incomes tend to be relatively lower and, you know, buyers are, you know, have limited budgets, right? So right. Well, that sample markets would be like for that situation? Yeah. So a lot of Midwest markets, for example, uh, you know, in, in the middle of last year, what was interesting to see is a lot of those Midwest, Midwest markets started appreciating pretty rapidly because mm -hmm. they didn't during the pandemic, you know, and there was some of that catching up going on. What you see across country right now a lot is markets that lagged during the pandemic are seeing a lot of appreciation and those that had a lot of appreciation are now readjust, readjusting to um, you know, to 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 uh, and accounting for that higher cost of home ownership. Right. So Midwest, uh, Cleveland, Detroit, you know, uh, Minneapolis too. Um, a lot of that Midwest uh, uh, part of the country was is really sensitive or has shown to be more sensitive to increases in mortgage rates right now. Interesting. Well, it was interesting. We got existing home sales for February, and the market was expecting for those numbers to be down one and a half percent when in fact it was up 9.5 percent month over month and so that was a bit of a shock do you want to walk us through like what do you think that's all about and what does it mean going forward um so say it again which which part was the, a shock the existing <laughs> just, home sales yeah. the market was expecting it to be down one and a half percent and instead it was up nine and a half percent for right, February. Right. How did that yeah. happen and and what happens next? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, this year is going to be full of surprises, in my opinion, because we're so sensitive to rates and because we are really still trying to understand what happens with the lock-in impact on the inventory, right? But um, I think what happened in, in February is that you had the decline in mortgage rates at the end of the year, especially following the Federal Reserve meeting in December, you know, mortgage rates fell, you know, seemingly very rapidly for, for you know, where we were at the time, they were down about like 140 basis points. So people rushed in, right? Buyers rushed in. And I think that's what drove uh, February home sales higher. Now, when you look at seasonally where changes are from January to February and then going further into the spring home buying season, they will increase. And so the 9% increase was actually in line with what we usually see this time of the year. You know, the last few years are sort of hard to yeah. use as a benchmark, but right. when you go back to 2019, 
that it was the same. It was a 10% increase in home sales between January and February. So it was right in line uh, with you know what we should be expecting. And I, I think that's what you see a lot in the housing markets right now is, is normalization, right? We had our trends go all over the place, you know, mm -hmm. we're all on a roller coaster ride. And now we are just sort of finding our way back to that normal, <laughs> you know, or, or pre-pandemic trend, I guess I'd call it. That's great news. I mean, we've been waiting for this. I mean, we, I mean, we wanted this, right? This yeah, yeah, no, we we do, we do. And and I think the other positive uh, driver here is that we're seeing improvements in inventory. You know, if you look at what's happening with new listings, um, they're up in many markets now. You know, depends where you are. I'm in LA. There's doesn't feel like there's ever enough <laughs> inventory. Yeah. You know, markets that just are generally broad stroke, broad, you know, broad, 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 broad brush stroke um, broad, yeah, broad on the brush. market. But you know, I sometimes, you know, try to sound smart and then I'm like, why did I just do That's that? Okay. <laughs> um, but, You're great. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, so inventory is up in most markets, you know, I mean, even in California, we are all sitting in California right now. It is up when you look at actually CAR data too. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I compare all data sets when I'm, when I'm trying to, you know, make sure I understand the housing story. So anyways, inventory is up in a lot of places. That's good. That's really, really good. Because I will say that what was constraining the inventory, uh, the housing market most in 2023 was the inventory. Right. Um, so so I'm really looking forward to what happens this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have a list of people who are pre-approved, ready to go, can't find a place. I was uh, talking to my buddy in Boston or just in the suburbs of Boston the other day. He has 70 buyers pre-approved in his market. Most of them are, you know, three and a half percent FHA or low down payments. And that makes it even harder when you're harder. up. Against, That's brutal. You know, the bigger down payments or God forbid all cash. Like it is, it is challenging out there. So it's not that there isn't a, a desire. People want to buy houses. That's for sure. And there was certain, the FHFA did a report that said that, there were 1.3 million home sales that didn't happen because people feel locked into their houses. They feel like they can't move, blah, blah, blah. But we've been talking about that because we're starting to see our clients say, hey, you know what? I know I have two point whatever percent. I've, I've got a couple. They they're in the twos on both their rental property and their and their mm -hmm. primary residence. Mm -hmm. And they called me. Uh, earlier this year and they're like oh, we're going to move this year we got to sell both of them because this isn't working for us i didn't hear a single rate word about rates and kevin will tell you i'm not exactly sympath i'm like listen we have to live our lives get over the rates people like literally just stop it you know does it cash flow do you need a place to live can you fit a fifth person into a two-bedroom condo no okay let's just move <laughs> it along shall we but anyway yeah. it is it's really interesting because we are seeing a shift um, we're hearing about it from one end of the country to the next. And we have to be part of the solution when it comes to helping people understand that these are not terrible rates. They're not great. Mm -hmm. God knows we don't want 8%, but we're not in a horrible rate environment now. And it mm -hmm. is time to live our lives, live our lives. You know, we were, oh my gosh, Kevin, I didn't do it. So we were talking about the fact that, um, Selma, when did you start your job with CoreLogic? It was March, what what was March it? March 17, 2020. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So we were, that was four years ago, kids. And if you recall four years ago. Uh, that that we was were, uh, the beginning of uh, COVID. I remember that. It was that locked day. down. Yeah. It was, we were in California. First day it, of was, lockdown. it was yeah. locked down. Patrick's day. It was yeah, shocking. It was. it was crazy. And it's about the time Kevin and I very shortly thereafter um, as leadership show. in the California Association of Mortgage Professionals started doing the show. And mm -hmm. so we've been doing it every Tuesday since we take one week off a year uh, between Christmas and New Year's. And um, I think we had to take July off last year because it was on a Tuesday. Otherwise, we have been faithful. But I was looking at some of the posts from four years ago and there was one. I mean, there are some of the funniest things because everyone idolizes that time. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. If only we could go back to that. Oh, it was so great. Do you mm -hmm. remember how much whining was happening back then? Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Oh my no, God, I'm yeah. tired. I just need a break. And I kept going, 
you know, people, this is cyclical. We're going to get a break and you're going to hate it because that's what <laughs> always happens. Now, I always underestimate the 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 extent of whatever <clears throat> is about to hit the fan, but it was um, it was not fun. And so we we started doing this four freaking years ago, Kevin. Can you believe it? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's amazing. I it's know. amazing your commitment to do it every week. It, <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like with only yes. one, one. No, we week, know. Week off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. No, but we love it too. Like it's, it's, we love the interaction with people. We love the fact that we meet people and they're like, oh my gosh, this was, this was my life safe, mm -hmm. you know, my lifeline during lockdown. I mean, it's really, it's really wonderful, but there was this thing that I posted that I meant to have handy, but I don't, of course, where, you know, oh, it, uh, you know, somebody calls into a mortgage office, loan officer, hello, may I help you? Caller, yes, can you tell me the rates? Loan officer, yeah, of course. Uh, let's see, that'll be three, three and three quarters. Uh, wait, no, uh, no, four and four and an eight. Yeah, that's it. No, wait, two and seven eights. I mean, do you remember that? It was literally just the rates were all over the place. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get an appraisal to save your life. You get a quote from one person, it'd be 1200 bucks. You get another one from someone else and it's like three grand or five grand or six weeks or, oh my God. Oh my God. So anyway, it is, um, it is, <laughs> really I just, I'm just here. going through that right now with one up in uh, Oregon where it's like, Twelve hundred dollars for an appraisal. I'm like, Jesus, like what? Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, but do you remember when they were three grand? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, it was crazy and not fun. So anyway, it's very easy to just think, you know, block out all the crap from before, um, and not and think that that was better than today. Today is better than then because we don't have like a false interest rate environment that should have never happened. And now we are getting back to, did you actually, you've said the word normal. I can't get over it. I'm so excited about that because that's what we want. And by the way, our industry is never normal, really. It's normal-ish. Mm -hmm. It's always got its own version of crazy. But anyway, I'm just, I'm just happy we're here. So anyway, that's- So I had a question for Selma in this. Yeah. Uh, so we actually do uh, say that CoreLogic, we have found that you guys are one of the best sources of data yes. uh, in yes. the mortgage yeah. industry. Um, and you know, I'll give you guys that kudos. Um, Thank you. What, yeah. what makes your you different? Uh, because you know, the other end of the spectrum is the jobs report from the government, which is a complete like we often say. Audrey and I could come up with a better number than they do. Um, sure. You know, so your numbers are, are reliable, and that's what you know should drive the market versus these numbers that are from the government that come out and they're just completely like a made up number a lot of times. Um, how is it you guys come up with your numbers and you know what is the the science behind it? <laughs> well, good thing is we don't have to come up with uh, some of the numbers that that census comes up with. You know yeah. our numbers. Uh, we we are experts and and first in business in terms of the data that we have. You know expertise in which is the housing data. So you know the advantage that we have is that we have such a comprehensive database of of you know property. Uh, exchanges of property transactions, you know, where, where you can get, um, uh, where you can get home prices from, you know, we have servicing data, we have appraisal data, we have uh, MLS data, we, I mean, we have such a broad range that really, uh, you know, enables us to take a really deep look into, you know, what's happening in the housing market, but, you know, I think that's sort of, you know, unfortunately, census doesn't have maybe that advantage in, you know, be, they rely on, they rely on, on uh, um, surveys, right? Yeah. And and when you have surveys, you know, and, you know, God help them, because this is not an easy, you know, when you don't have comprehensive databases, it, it, you do have to rely on surveys. And if you have a small sample, and think about oh, the, this gosh. way, too, hmm? A small sample is almost worthless. Well, the other, yes, it, I mean, it, it makes data very volatile. And the other thing is that with 
you know, people nowadays don't even want to respond to surveys. You know, back in the right. day we had, you know, landlines and we were, you know, responding to landlines and, and you always picked up the phone because, you you know, that was now with cell phones and, and spams, you know, and, and not knowing the number. I just think it's that much harder to collect survey data now than it used to be. And you see that in survey results where there is much less... Uh, response rate is much lower and then survey results go all over the place they bounce around so you know I, I think you know not to blame them but it's just that's how that's the nature of the beast in terms of the data right where are you yep. getting sourcing your data from now we can't report on labor statistics for example so I will not say that we have better data there you know we, right. we certainly have with the housing data but not the labor data but we have okay so we have ADT who is is has actual people that it's following like tens of millions of people that it's following what is it kevin is it 10 million or 20 it's like it's either yeah. 10 million or 20 million it's a huge number and mm -hmm. so those are actual people with actual jobs and paychecks which to me seems so much more reliable than any sort of sampling or yeah, the, the only problem with adt is it's only adt so if someone switches like a zero I get it. I do. Payroll, I then, and it throws the mm -hmm. data off and uh, I don't think right. it covers government employees, et cetera, et cetera. But still, yeah. again, but I don't understand why they can't just get all the the paycheck companies together and report their data. Well, you have nowadays a lot of different companies reporting on labor. Mm -hmm. You know, there there will there is the you know there's LinkedIn data, there is Zip is a zip recruiter data there is you know all kinds of companies are now reporting. So I think you know the the sort of I guess maybe the advantage is that that you get to track all different data sources and understanding what the difference is, is gives you a more complete uh, view of the of the market um so it, you know th that's a lesson too like don't pay attention to just one data source you know you, you have yes. to you know be very comprehensive if you want to be an expert in the field well then why I just I, I just wish the market would wake up and let be less responsible to BLS data than it is because it moves the markets. And the other thing that concerns me is, you know, it's part of the Fed's dual mandate is full employment, is mm -hmm. uh, inflation, but also full employment. So when it's looking at the unemployment rate and it's like, oh, well, it went from 3.7 to 3.9 and we don't expect it to go over 4% or 4.1, yet the Congressional Budget Office is forecasting 4.4%. And if you actually look at it, and again, I'm not an expert in this, so please feel free to correct me on anything, but there's the U3 numbers in the BLS numbers, and then there's the U6 numbers, right? And my mm -hmm. understanding is U6 uh, unemployment numbers include the people who have stopped looking for the jobs versus the U3, which excludes anyone who hasn't looked for a job in the last four weeks. Am I on track here? Yeah, yeah, there, okay. there are different measures, absolutely. Right, mm -hmm. so if if the U3 number is at 3.9 right now and it just jumped up from 3.7 to 3.9, I'm concerned. The Fed seems to be shrugging it off so far, but then if you look at the U6 numbers, when you look at all the people who are unemployed but and haven't been looking for the last four weeks, including them, we're in the sevens. And so it's not quite as rosy as it would seem. And what am I missing here? Tell me, Tell me where I'm wrong. And that I should not worry about. This. <laughs> Tell me not to worry, Selma. Well, yeah, I in terms of unemployment, I wouldn't. I that, that wouldn't be my concern because we are, we are in, in an environment of labor shortages across yes. d many industries, and one big one is housing, for example. So think about like if if we had more construction workers, how much more new construction we'd have, and that would put you know. Uh, well, it would take pressure off of home price growth, yeah. Um, and we could certainly, in many markets, benefit from more, more new. The labor shortage is really affecting housing because yeah. I, I have a son in the construction business, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, companies are throwing out these. Well, I'll consider the project if you offer me this crazy, you know, construction price." And people are offering that price, and they're like, "What? Mm -hmm. Someone actually is going to offer me, you know." Mm -hmm tens and thousands of dollars to do a simple job okay fine i'll take it um yeah. so that because they're just a serious shortage but then they run yeah. into the problem is then they have to scramble to find the guys that'll you know do the work you know because yeah. the guys at home people that sign up there they're, they're not skilled labor um mm -hmm. right right Right. And, and then in terms of the unemployment rate, you all, as you mentioned, you have, you know, people in the labor force divided by people that 
um, um, so people working divided by overall labor supply. And if you have, you know, so we, for example, we've had uh, immigration, high immigration lately, that can mm -hmm. drive numbers up yes. uh, too. So I don't know that um, when Fed is trying to decide what to do next, you know, especially around this uh, rate cut that we are so anxiously anticipating, I think that unemployment is not a major concern right now. What is more concerning to them is you know, getting the inflation back in check. And, you know, there's so many components to inflation that, that are volatile. First of all, you know, you have food prices and gas prices. Okay, and we take that out, which they have been taking out. You have things that are now, um, there's this spillover effect from high rate of uh, inflation over the last couple of years. And one being, for example, insurance. When you think about homeowner insurance, auto insurance, medical insurance, med cost of medical services, that's now you know one of those components of that super core uh, measure that, that they're tracing uh, tracking that you know is a bit of a concern you know so so it's you know I I think. You know, and actually, you know, as part of the group that I am uh, part of a group, I'm a part of a group of, of economists that we meet with Federal Reserve uh, a couple of times a year and, and we give them our updates of, of, from our own, from our industry perspective. And they are very in tune with what's going on. It's just calibrating. Know. Yeah, the calibrating can be, you know, very difficult because, you know, I, I think at this point, what's most concerning to them is, you know, to jump ahead and do something too quick and you mm -hmm. have re acceleration and inflation i think that's what they're deathly you know worried about and and so that's holding things back a little bit but but now, now you know, i've also heard that they're also worried about in fact deflation um that well, is some yes yeah, some are some are yeah. so, you know some are you know there's very there's varied perspectives within you know the group um mm -hmm. so so some are are and um because you know sort of when you start stripping out a lot of things that you understand why the inflation persists you start thinking okay well actually long term we're going to see prices decline you know one for example one thing being you know we have aging population right people right. when they age they spend less you know mm -hmm. they have you know less um they have fixed incomes that tend to start spending less. That tends to lead to disinflation, and and, and so also you, takes capital out of the market. Also, right, right, exactly. Yeah. And so, so we, you know, thinking long term, it is one of the things we're we're thinking about. I mean, also as part of the housing market, you know, you may have heard about that silver tsunami terminology, with basically baby boomers aging out of the home ownership. And, you know, what, that, what does that mean for supply going forward? We're so under supply now, but what happens 10 years from now? Um, you know, and that's kind of been a recent hot topic. You know, I have my own thoughts, but we don't have to go into that right now. Uh, we can move on to something else if you want why, to. Why don't we? I mean, tell us what you think about that. So sure. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Like, yeah, sure. I, I my thought my take on it is that we're so severely undersupplied that even so that some projections showed a 10 10 million homes coming on market over the next 10 year period from baby boomers right when you look at where inventory right now is it's about a million uh, in early 2000s we were at about 4 million and then we had that continual decline right and so we've built a pent up demand of you know cumulatively in my opinion more than 10 million homes uh over the last year when you look at how many young adults still with, live with their parents how many what the turnover is you know the housing turnover we are at the lowest rate of turnover in the housing market that we've had going back to 1960s outside those really high inflationary periods um so we have you know people just sitting there waiting and not wanting to move because they either can't find what they're looking for they can't afford it you know how many times do you hear i want to move but i i there's no home to move to you yep. know and so so that's spent up demand right and and so i think you know i think it that wave of baby boomer uh, exiting home ownership will help but certainly not lead to oversupply 
anytime soon, maybe in 30 years. I don't know. We'll see. But 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 not anytime soon. I'm so happy to hear you say that. I couldn't agree more. And and I yeah, I'm so glad that you shared that with us. So please don't hold back, Selma. Come on. Okay. Yeah. It's all okay. good. We love it. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so back to the Fed. So no rate change this time. No one expected a rate change this time, although at the beginning of the year, they certainly were thinking mm -hmm. maybe March, maybe. Yeah. So yeah. we have Fed meetings coming up on May 1st and June 12th. They seem to be very focused on the balance sheet mm -hmm. and balance sheet runoff and, you know, perhaps easing a little of the QT. Can you speak to that? And what are your thoughts on, you know, how it's looking? Uh, their latest, it looked like the median you know, in the dot plot was that, you know, like maybe three, three cuts, maybe this year, 75 basis points. So anyway, walk us through where your thoughts are on all that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, I think, you know, we still are in that camp of three rate cuts this year. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, I, I think for the Fed right now, well, okay. So, you know, when you think about mortgage rates, there is the, you know, 10 year treasury of which you're, you're pricing out 30 year fixed. Um, and then, you know, federal federal reserve rate, a uh, federal, yeah. Uh, Fed funds. It, it's, it's Fed funds rate. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Fed funds rate, you know, 10 year treasury price of base of that and so on and so forth. So it matters what happened. But what's even more important for mortgage rates is the mortgage rate spread. And the fact that we don't have many investors in mortgage backed securities right now. And I think that that lack of liquidity is what's concerning Federal Reserve a little bit. You know, there's there's some technical explanations for what's going on but you know in terms of you know issuance you know fiscal debt issuance and 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 so on and so forth so so they are right now really worried about liquidity in the market and so that's hence that you know maybe slowing of that but um, of the tightening that you're mentioning qt um but but more importantly for us is what does that mean for mortgage rates right and so the lack of investors in the market is, I think, what's preventing us from sort of getting back to that spread that we saw, um, you know, prior to, well, basically prior to the pandemic, but also prior to when the Federal Reserve started tightening in, in summer of 2022. You know, it, it's grown almost by double uh, the, the the spread. And, and so until we see more investors coming in, and how do we get investors coming in? Well, they have to be more comfortable with volatility, right? You mentioned volatility earlier. We have so much volatility and how do you get an investor to come in when there is so much volatility yeah. in the market? You know, the other thing is, you know, they know people will prepay as soon as they, yeah, get they an repay. opportunity. Yeah. So that's another reason for not maybe entering right now. So, so we have this like, you know, chicken or the egg situation where it would help to have lower mortgage rates to stabilize things, but to get there, you get, you know, gotta get investors in and who starts first. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. So we'll see is basically yes, we'll right. See. <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> to be <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you think that they're I mean, they're not gonna wait till we get to two percent core PCE for sure. But no, I mean no. they're it it sounds Indeed. like they're trying to get us ready for okay, we're gonna do something on the balance sheet and and uh be you know, get ready for that. Kevin, were you gonna say something? Well, I was thinking because a lot of times people are projecting whether the, the Fed drops are gonna be a half or a quarter percent. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see them only going down a quarter each for each drop, or do you see them dropping a half? I think a quarter. I think a quarter. I think you know we still have a very strong economy. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think just a quarter. If there was more significant signs of 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 a slowing of economic activity, maybe half. But but we right. we're not seeing that yet. Yeah. No, we're we're kicking. You know, the U.S. economy is very you know robust. Yes. Uh, I, I saw a stat that there's only three countries in the world that are not in recession right now. U.S., mm -hmm. Mexico, and India are the only three countries that are not suffering. Uh, right, right. So. Well, Switzerland just raised their version of the Fed funds or lowered it, their version of Fed funds in a quarter last week. So that was interesting. So, 
Um, well, okay, Europe so is really struggling, you know, with, with all of this uh, geopolitical risk. I think Europe is struggling and they've, you know, they've not seen any type of rebound in economic activity that we did, you know, mm -hmm. coming out of the pandemic. So, so Europe, Europe's it's getting much a lot different. of trouble going forward. Mm -hmm. We've talked it's about a... this before on here, but the fact that Europe and most of the world actually doesn't have a fixed rate, a fixed mm -hmm. mortgage rate. So they are all very... They're all very susceptible to any rate changes, and it's been rough on them. I I had talked about this in the fall. I was in uh, Europe and UK in November, and I talked to people who were really in trouble with their housing situations because of the difference in the rates and how quickly they had gone up and how much more it cost to do said rates, et cetera. I mean, a million different things. So it is really rough in other parts of the country. And you know, maybe our 30 year fixed rate is too long because most people don't stay in it. But, mm -hmm. you know, there apparently is something to be said for not having everyone on a five year fix or five year. We're not supposed wow. to be fixed anymore. Yeah. Thank you. 30, 30 year fix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so let's talk about yield curves for a minute, just because um, we. OK, so we've been talking about the yield curve inversion for. Well, according to Dr. Elliot Eisenberg, uh, 32124 Mike marked the 625th consecutive day of the inversion of the 210 yield curve. This means the two year treasury has consistently exceeded the yield on the 10 year treasury since early July 2022, breaking the record of 624 days in 1978. So he went on to say yield curve inversions occur when the Fed battles inflation and are closely re and are closely followed since dating back to 1970. Every inversion has preceded a recession. So we started talking about recessions in summer of 2022. And we had talked about them for so long that I don't remember when it was, Kevin. A few months ago, I decided that we should turn the R word into a drinking game. And every time that somebody said recession on the show, you had to take a shot. And then we decided <laughs> that it would be by the end of the hour, we'd all be on the floor. There's no way we'd make it. I was just so sick. I'm talking about in recessions, which it hasn't come. I mean, what do you think? Yield curve inversions? Are we going to have a recession? What do you think? Are we getting a soft landing, Selma? Well, I think we are. I mean, I think what we underestimated uh, coming out of the pandemic is the strength of your consumer, you know, mm -hmm. your consumer resiliency and the fact that First of all, they've saved up so much, right? We've saved up as, as a country so much during the pandemic. And and at the same time, we say we saved on say refinances. When you think about how many people refi, when mm -hmm. you think about how many people took an opportunity of the arbitrage to move to a more affordable uh Orange. city, but yeah. yeah, but but keep the same income level. Um, so we as a country are richer, you know, maybe we don't but maybe we have not improved our, our um uh, our income inequality at all but we are overall uh, you know as a country richer than we and we have more spending power and i think that's what we didn't realize coming into the qt you know it was that people are if you're not buying a car and if you're not buying a home you're really not exposed to these higher rates and you know for a lot of people it didn't have any impact you know yes inflation foods were, food was more expensive gas was more expensive i mean think about going to a restaurant i you know, I get so frustrated when I see prices on at a restaurant because I like to eat out, you know, and 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 it's it's it feels sometimes that there is a bit of a um, opportunistic activity going on. But, you know, that that, that aside. Um, so so, you know, people are in many ways, um, you know, we're more resilient than we gave them credit to be. And so. So the the impact of this tightening of higher borrowing rates was not so 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 widespread, and at the same time, I think what we didn't realize is, you know, so when the economy opened up and and well, so when we went into the pandemic, how many people retired, you know, which created that additional su labor sh supply shortage. Um, so we continue to have very competitive labor markets. Uh, we continue to see strong. Uh, income growth. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think that all feeds. I mean, there's, there's a lot to, to consider when think about what, what drives a, a recession, but but I think it's really U.S. consumer being so strong. Uh, the fact that we underestimated the strength of U.S. consumer. 
So how do we reconcile that with what we're seeing with credit card uh, balances and the Rising. fact we thought we had really gone nuts when we hit a trillion dollars in early 2023. And mm. I don't even know where we are now. We were at, at 1.7 at one point later in 2023. Like, so the credit, the consumer has done their part and, you know, kept GDP propped up by their spending, but on, you know, using credit. And so mm -hmm. as that's catching up with people, because interest rates on credit cards range, you know, between what, 24.99 and 32.99%, like it's not sustainable. So is there, I mean, are people, are economists thinking about that and worried about that at all? Yeah, no, absolutely. We do pay attention to all of these, you know, and and especially the you know the defaults, the defaults on, on consumer credit cards on autos have been of concern. But when you look at the you know dig a little bit deeper, who is driving that? It's usually mostly younger adults, mm -hmm. and uh, well, there is people with lower income, obviously. You know, and I don't want to undermine the the fact that we still have huge inequalities in the US and there are people that were really hard hit by by you know rising prices in general but mm -hmm. but you know who utilizes credit much more these days is, is these young people and um and they in my opinion, are not necessarily yet well versed in how to manage credit. If you think about nowadays, you know, when, you know, sort of I was younger, you didn't have this, this everything you buy, you can now finance, right? Online with car, car right. now yeah. or whatever, right? And I think, you know, it's, it's an education right now. It's an education to for young people who are not who don't know financial literacy how to manage and they, they, they'll you know see impact because their their mortgage their their credit scores are going to be impacted uh but but really when you look at down who is driving this it's mostly younger younger population so um i don't think and it's it is still on the margin and so oh the other thing about the credit utilization too is you know the more money you spend you have the more money you, you spend right and the more people you have so the fact that just the fact that we are spending more and using more credit is not necessarily in itself a problem it only becomes a problem if you have higher rates of default if people stop right. paying and and yeah. but in terms of the, at least mortgage mortgage uh you know uh delinquency rates they are at lowest that we've seen, you know. Right. So, so people are definitely paying their mortgages. They may not be good at paying their bank cards, and and they'll, you know, they'll see the impact of that. But, you know, in terms of like um, bigger impact on the economy, it's not. It's not. We're not seeing any any bigger impact that we're concerned about. Oh well, that's good to hear. Um, okay, so I heard you speak about this, and I'd like to share you to share with the group because we've talked it about it a number of times. So we've talked about hedge funds owning large bits of real estate throughout the country. But then I saw somebody uh, or I heard somebody say that 92% of investor properties are owned by mom and pops. And so, and so tell us what your thoughts are on hedge funds. Are they as big a deal as we've been led to believe? And should we worry less about them or more or like, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, so I think the issue is that they're, you know, they're concentrated in, in a few markets, right? The, the big investors. So, for example, when you look at which markets have smaller investors versus large investors, California is most small investors, mom and pop kind of, you know, small oh. REITs and, and things like that. But when you go to Atlanta, you go to Dallas, Phoenix, uh, Tampa, it's mostly institutional investors and it's and it's really you know as a share of total purchases it is relatively higher right we are talking about 98% 92% nationally and 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 uh 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 right so so spread out but when you look at concentration they are concentrated in some markets and so i think for those markets it is a bit of a um you know what happens you know what happens is, is that limiting opportunities for home buyers to to mm -hmm. enter the market I, I think being the the biggest concern but otherwise you know why when you think of why why are they investing in these markets these are hard population growth markets mm -hmm. and so they have a guaranteed demand in a sense you know and so i don't see that as being uh as much of an issue um you know 
in general, if in fact we have more, and these are also uh, markets with a lot of new construction. So it's not like you're taking, you know, a California market that doesn't have any activity and, and only investors are buying versus the market where there are more opportunities to purchase and you just so happen to have a, a relatively more concentration of hedge funds, you know. Plus, the other thing is when you think about these markets, where there's a large concentration of institutional investors, it's usually also, um, these are maybe, you know, uh, so have high population growth. And so a lot of new people are coming in, in the market, testing it. Do I like this neighborhood? Do I like this? Right. You know, so, so it's a good renters. opportunity. Yeah. So it's a good opportunity to explore, right? New, new area and, and see if you like it, if you like the job and so on and so forth. So I don't think that in itself is necessarily bad, but but I would just say that if we have an issue, we have an issue with new, a lack of new construction. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that rolls back. Mm -hmm. I had an interesting interview I listened to with CEO of um, one of the big companies that buys up a lot of the properties. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was quite interesting because they kind of got in it accidentally when, you know, after 08, they... Mm -hmm. um, they seem to end up acquiring some properties accidentally. And then they realize, hey, wait a minute, this math works. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they just got, but what they realized he was talking about was how now they have all this data on owning real estate in the United States. And, and by real estate, I mean single family homes and how mm -hmm. there's like a whole period of, you know, when you buy it, well, how the values go up and down with the market. But then there's times in the market when you want to, there's peak points when you want to get rid of it from them, their point of view, because the market shifts, you get, like you were saying, there's certain times when there's more renters in a market and you want to provide mm -hmm. that house for those renters. But then at some point, those renters decide they, they want to stay put or they now their income is enough and they want to buy a home. Uh, and then mm -hmm. that's the time to kind of shift to from, you know, being a owner of a rental to selling to rentals uh, to, you know, primary owners. So it was quite interesting. They also talked about, the maintenance schedules of all these homes yeah. and they, they have it down to a science, which is really mm -hmm. interesting um, because, mm -hmm. you know, you know, a lot of people that, you know, we at mom and pop or you and me, you know, we fix the roof when we have the money to fix the roof. We don't fix yeah. it when it's optimal to fix the roof. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's just kind of one of those things. Well, if you own a rental property and your tenant's calling you because the roof is leaking. Yeah, I mean, you got to go out there. the time you're fixing the roof, whether you have the money or not. No, you? you're doing it in the store and that's when you're doing it. That's right. That's right. That's all. That's the only time I ever hear from a landlord is when it's rainy and their tenant is calling and that's when the roof gets addressed. So it is, uh, yeah, sometimes necessity, right? Um, okay. So CoreLogic has a rent survey that you do and it is wonderful because it's so accurate um, I am wondering, because you just released it a couple of days ago, and it looks like rent growth, you do a blended uh, survey between, uh, not survey, but you're, an, tell us, tell us about your survey. Tell us about okay. what you do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So right. basically it's, we develop a single family rent index uh, based on transactions, single family rent transactions that happen in MLS. So, right, it's a simple in the sense in the sense that it's not the entirety of the rental market, and it's not also not entirety of the single family rental market, right? Because it only transacts through MLS. But it's shown because of the large sample size, right? A lot of transactions actually do happen through MLS, so it's proven to be. Um, right a good indicator for what's happening yeah, in imagine. single family rental space mm -hmm. yeah yeah so basically what we are she and the second reason why this index is so important is it's a leading indicator to uh, owners equivalent rent in the shelter inflation a, comp a shelter component of the inflation which the fed obviously is is very um in tune with so but going back to single family rent index, so basically we're seeing slowing of rent appreciation, uh, but now it's sort of leveled off. Now it's come back to the levels we saw pre-pandemic, which is again a good thing because 20% appreciation of rent is unsustainable. Yeah. Uh, and that's hence why we have these inflation issues and and more and Fed not wanting to budge. Um, but um, so basically return to rates of appreciation that we saw prior to the pandemic. Um, what's, that, what's that rate? About? It's about 3%, 25 to 3%. Okay, yeah, fine. and it's it's leveled off at, at this level. And by the um, way, in June of 2022, we were at 14%. That right, I mean, right. that's, yeah. I mean, just to give you some comparison 
to where we've come from. It's mm-hmm. right, big, right, big. exactly. So why exactly. is your number so much lower than what we're seeing in the inflation numbers in the rent, in the rent, you know, like when they're doing the owner's equivalent rent, I, again, we go back to this idea of surveys where you're going to call someone and ask them, okay, what do you think your house would rent for? I mean, you call me and ask me, I don't know. I mean, how right. would well, I know? That's part of the you're relatively too. educated. I, yeah, relatively, yeah. right. Exactly. Relatively. I'm not, I, I certainly don't know what my house would rent for. So you call me, you're not going to get a good answer. So let's assume that, you know, not everyone even knows what you and I might not know. And now this is what we're basing our our inflation data on. Explain, please. <laughs> okay, so well, inflation what inflation shelter inflation tries to measure or owners equivalent rent is what overall rent is. And we know that not everybody moves in a given year. Only a very small percentage of people. Now I think it's even less than ten percent of people move uh, at any point within a year. And so the way the data is calculated, it really um, captures only about a 12th of that change, given that it's, you know, serving somebody in January um, and they have made, they may have moved within the last year. So it's capturing something with, with, with the 12 month, could be captured something with a 12 month delay. So the issue with OER or the shelter inflation in general is that it captures um, overall market, not what's currently happening with rates in uh, rental changes in rate, rental rates in the market. And so, uh, because we've had that fourteen percent increases um, a couple of years ago, it's only now slowly playing itself through that inflation measure. It's like a pig in a python kind of thing, right? It's moving really slowly through that python uh, simply because of the way the data is is measured, right? And it's it's with it serviced the entire market, not just the movers. Right. So that's the issue. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm like, okay, I am just, I am not a fan of basing our economy on numbers that are somebody's best guess on a day when God knows what's going on, what their education level is in terms of the subject. I mean, ugh, anyway. Um, you know, they, they, as a result of that, just, just one point to add, as a result of that, they have developed a new tenant index. So BLS now has a new tenant index. Um, that also gets reported on as part, part of an inflation shelter measure because they want to be more on top of what's currently happening in the market. So, so they're, they're trying. They're trying. Okay. I, you know what? I keep hearing this. They're trying. The poor things are underfunded. They're understaffed. I'm like, okay, well, let's, I, let, know, let's all vote. Do we want them to have more money so they can do their job better? Yes, please. Yeah. God. Well, you but, know, if, yeah. if you want bad data, it's obviously ask the individual you know, person renting, but the person who owns a place, they have the same problem when they decide, okay, my tenants just moved out. They were paying $4,000 a month. I haven't changed their rent for two years. Uh, what should I rent it out for? And it really comes down at different times of the year. Um, yeah. You know, that's if you're going to rent it out in January, you're kind of screwed. You're going to have to rent it out for a lower rate than you could if you're renting it out in July. Um, right. You know, it's just, it's, it goes through the same cycles. And then for a landlord, it's like, where's the data? You know, they can pull up on Craigslist and see, oh, look, there's a house. It's very similar to mine. And they're asking, you know, $5,000 for it. But um, you don't know how long it's been on the market. You just logged into, you know, Craigslist mm-hmm. this week and you saw, oh, well, it could have been sitting there for three months at the $5,000 and no one's biting. Or it could have just popped up last week and it was under the market and someone picked it up really quick. Um, yeah, yeah. there's a lot to rental prices. It's, it's hard to manage. It is. It's it hard is. to manage. Selma, I think that, um, the last time I emailed you, I said that I thought that we might have to stay on for about three days, uh, <laughs> on the list of things that I had, um, that we had prepared for you today. And here we are at the end of the hour. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. So we did not get to everything. There's a couple of comments. Dirk said, thanks, Audrey and Kevin. You get me through my Peloton workout. So I'm glad to know that we can entertain you and and uh, provide some relief while you're doing your morning workout. Um, you also made a mention that feast and famine are the normal for our business. And that, you know, so what normal are we talking about? That is 100% correct. Like our normal is it's either like, so, so, you know, we're all exhausted because it's so busy or 
oh my God, what are we doing? So, mm -hmm. um, and then we had some questions about the NAR uh, settlement. And so just quickly, Salma, do you have an opinion about any of that or do you want to just call it? Do you think it? it's going to affect housing at all? Well, I think who gets, well, what I worry about is that who gets affected are the uh, first time home buyers, people who don't know how to go through the process. I know when I bought my first house, I was terrified, even though, even though this was after I already was a real estate agent. Yeah. Um, I only recently bought my first house and um, I was terrified because it is the biggest decision one makes in their life, one of the biggest decisions. And so um, I think first time home homebuyers will need help. And and so how is that going to play out? That's, you know, to be seen. But yeah, I, 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 think, it, it, it I just, think in the end, there won't be that big a change. Me too. It It is not just first time homebuyers who need help. Everyone mm -hmm. needs help because there are mm -hmm. hair, there's hair on deals. Okay, so what reports do I get? What do the reports mean? Who's going to let everyone into the houses? Do you want any old person just wandering through your house as a buyer? Is the seller's agent really going to jump up and go let every single person in? No, I mean, that's not going to happen. But the last two deals I've closed recently would not have closed had there not been two really professional realtors on either side of them. Because mm -hmm. for two separate reasons, they were, they were not easy. They were complicated. There were a lot of things to work out and that is not for the faint of heart. And it's, I have a real estate license. I have a, I've never, ever done my own transaction ever, ever. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Because I know enough to know that I'm not qualified. I don't do real yeah. estate transactions every day. So mm -hmm. I need an expert to guide me through that. And the deals that we have when we're LOs that don't have an agent on both sides are rough. We're doing mm -hmm. quadruple duty because someone's got to look out for the buyer if there's mm -hmm. no agent, you know, in there for them. Even the people, they're like, of course, I'm representing both sides. It's really hard to do. So yeah. mm -hmm. in an ideal situation, yeah, it's fine. But not every situation is ideal and you don't know when yours will be or won't be. So that's before we even get to first time home buyers, which is a whole nother conversation. So with uh, <laughs> Dr. Hep. I would just like to say thank you so much for today. It was absolutely a pleasure. Uh, again, we love CoreLogic. I mean, if you had told me when I was younger that I would love a data source, I would have thought you were out of your mind. But here we are, and I do. And so we really appreciate you being here today. And we'll really look forward to seeing you again sometime, I hope. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was such a pleasure on my end as well. Thank you for having me. I look forward to our next meeting. Our pleasure. All right. Bye guys. Have a great week.